Hey, enough of my books, let's talk about yours. Author C.K. Brook here. Today's guest is Danielle K. Rue. Danielle, thank you for joining me this morning. And remind me, where in the world are you joining me from? I am in Redwood City, California, right outside of San Francisco. Ooh, so is this early in the morning for you? It's 9.30. Okay. <laughs> So, so you are like just just waking up with your cup of coffee and your fuzzy robe and joining me in snowy Detroit where I am. <laughs> exactly. From, you know, yeah, from nice and sunny California. Oh, you're so lucky. Well, I am. I am happy to have you here, and um, hopefully, you'll blow some of that warm California breeze my way. Folks, Danielle K. Rue is a writer, teacher, and historian. Her first new adult fantasy novel, August Prather Is Not Dead Yet, that's the title, is currently available in ebook and paperback through Parliament House Press and will soon be available in hardcover and audiobook. That is so exciting. Her new young adult supernatural slash urban fantasy series, This Will Kill That, was also acquired by Parliament House this year, so look out for updates. Danielle has always loved reading and telling stories, especially stories with adventure, mystery, humor, romance, and at least a little bit of spookiness. Danielle lives with her wife and two orange cats in the San Francisco Bay Area. She has added a lot of young adult fantasy fiction to her bookshelves recently and regrets nothing. When she isn't writing or thinking about writing, Danielle is building houses in The Sims, a woman after my own heart, listening to podcasts, also a woman after my own heart, or taking BuzzFeed quizzes to find out what kind of tree she is based on her hair color. She has recently been watching lots of old BB see period pieces and some of them are good. She has begun to drink Diet Coke and is worried this might be a real problem. Coffee and tea are still her primary beverages of choice. So I love your bio, <laughs> first of all. It's so colorful. I love it. Um, so before we even launch into anything, we have to talk about your titles first because we have August Prather is not dead yet and we have This Will Kill That. Those are two titles that just... Those are not titles you see every day. They jump right out at you. Um, where do you get your, your title naming savvy from? <laughs> Thanks. Um, August Prather is not dead yet. I was working on that one for a while. Um, I originally called it, is she dead or is she sleeping? I just, I wanted the word dead in there somewhere. And I, I ended up with... Um, the character's name I thought was so profound, so I wanted to include that in the title. August Prather is not dead yet. Um, this Will Kill That came from a quote, a uh, Victor Hugo quote, actually. Oh. And I learned that one in architecture school. So the, <laughs> um, they talk about the cathedral, um, cathedrals and architecture being uh, no longer relevant because books and like the printing press will come along and and uh and destroy them so this will kill that but it's sort of a, a quote about technology in general and also about like sort of the inevitability of destroying things <laughs> i love it i love it so there's like multi-layered meanings there that we can dig into when we start to talk more about um the content of your books but with my guests what i like to do always is start from the beginning. Although in your case, um, before I even ask you, you know, what was your earliest experience with creative writing? You know, were you six years old and you started right, drawing your own picture books? Um, before we get into that, I want to know, uh, what is your background? You're a teacher and historian. You mentioned you went to architecture school. Um, so share with us a little um, who you are in your everyday, like, tax-paying citizen um, <laughs> <laughs> alias. <laughs> yeah. And, and writing and, um, and reading. 
That's fascinating. So does your interest in, in architecture and things like that um, kind of play into your enjoyment of <laughs> building houses in The Sims? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is where that comes from. Yes. I'm, you know, it's so funny, and I should mention it to my husband because – you know, we have a, a six-year-old going on seven, and he's obsessed with building things in Minecraft, and my husband and I constantly, not argue, but we kind of are like, well, is that, is this really a skill he's developing? Is he really going to be interested in architecture as a result of this, or is it just a game? But you are kind of proof that you can start with a video game or a computer game, and it can actually lead to a professional interest, so that just tickles me pink. Um. <laughs> it's true. I actually do know another uh, an architect. Several people who stayed in architecture who who started by building houses in the Sims. So. That's amazing. <laughs> I that is so amazing. I can't wait to like tell people. And my my best buddy that used to play the Sims with me. Shout out to my friend Noelle. Um, <laughs> she will be she will be tickled to hear that too. That's awesome. Um. Now I have that soundtrack playing in my head, you know, that piano music when, <laughs> because I too spent many hours building, I, I didn't care about playing with the people. I just like building their houses and towns and all that. So, <laughs> so now, um, so that is fascinating. And I also think that the study of, of architecture, um, and, and, and this, this old architecture and also the societies that built them, because we know architecture was also kind of to reflect the philosophy or, or the beliefs of the time. You know, you had, um, for example, the Gothic cathedrals where they had the ceilings really high and the, you know, to remind you that God is so high up above you and you are so tiny. Uh, whereas then in, in the Renaissance, they kind of leveled it out and made the buildings more rectangular so that you feel more like your um level with god or that god is more approachable or so i'm just remembering this from my high school art <laughs> history class you know and um so i could totally see how that lends itself to just all sorts of creative ideas and musings because it's it's more than just buildings and building material there there are like beliefs and philosophies and societies there's there's meaning behind the architecture you know that that goes into it all um and and so it sounds like like me you're kind of inspired by like cultures and and people to write so um so now I do want to ask you um how old were you when did it start with your your a discovery of a love and a talent for creative writing. Um, who were your earliest influences, if any? So I was reading a lot of, I guess, middle grade, probably technically fantasy. Um, Philip Pullman, who did the the Golden Compass mm -hmm. and the His Dark Materials trilogy, loved it. Um, I was super into that, and I was also reading um, some other. Um, I think it's T. A. Barron. Um, wrote this series about Merlin, and there was a character in that series that was female, that was a, a witch, and her name was Rhiannon, like the song mm -hmm. by Fleetwood Mac. And I, I, love that um, song. I was just really interested in her, but she never got enough screen time, basically, in the book. So that kind of made me think, ah, oh, if I wrote a story, it would be, you know, the female characters front and center, doing stuff, making things happen. Um, because that's more interesting to me, personally. Um, <laughs> and then when I got older, I started writing fan fiction a little bit. Um, but I did start writing my own stuff pretty much right away. I was like, well, what if I made like, a female witch character of my own, and I started writing about her? Um, and then that kind of became several different little novels that I wrote as a kid, uh, I guess like age... 12. I'm not quite sure of my timeline. Uh, my wife always corrects me. <laughs> That's okay. Like in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, lots of supernatural stuff though, and um, witches and other worlds and magic. And um, a lot of that stuff was much more high fantasy than what I write now, which is kind of funny. Did you, uh, did you ever read The Mists of Avalon by Marion Zimmer Bradley? I, I would strongly recommend that to you if, if you're, you know, because that, that is the book that you were looking for. I read that when I was about, I think, 15. Um, that is the book you were looking for of the whole King Arthur story told by the the witch's point of view or the priestess, you know. Point, yeah, you would, you would love it, I think. <laughs> 
but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Of course. (laughs) We all remember those websites (laughs) that shall not be named. (laughs) Yes. Uh, So we ended up, you know, playing with that. And so then my stuff started getting more romantic uh, and and a little smutty. And uh, yeah. (laughs) So so are either, are either, was that just your fan fiction or are either of your books a little smutty? Oh, yeah. Well, so... uh, I love those romances too, where it is more about the adventure and what they've gone through. And then at the end of the day, they realize that all this kind of history and tension has built between them. And it just, it just makes you feel more connected or something. Um, do you write predominantly um, like LGBTQT romance or do you also write straight romance or what is your style? Yeah, it's mostly um, LGBTQ. It's mostly queer kids. Uh, so I don't really write, yeah, I don't really write, originally I did when I was younger, wrote, wrote like, you know, girl and boy kind of Gotcha. Things, but no, I don't as much. Um, a lot of my characters are, are bi or pansexual, so sometimes they do have romantic interests that are, um, you know, male, female pairs, but, uh, not as much. When you, when you say <laughs> pan? Like to see a little bit more of the, you know. The diversity. The Yeah, and that's a really hot genre right now because that's a niche that, you know, people are really only just starting to get into when it comes to new adult, young adult. Um, So there's definitely a demand for that. Uh, When you say pansexual, do you have like like robot or alien romances going on or... (laughs) Or like werewolf shifter. (laughs) That kind of reminds me of how... um, Netflix was responding to, I think it was like the Lost in Space reboot, and people thought that the robot was really hot. For oh, Did you yeah. hear about all that? <laughs> Netflix tweeted at their own fans, y'all need Jesus. Oh. <laughs> they were like, um, people were well, lusting after the robot. I used to get crushes on, you know, cartoon characters and stuff. Yeah, so. I I did too. I think, I think that's more normal than people like to admit. Yeah. <laughs> So, I, mean, I, think, I think that's fine. <laughs> so you kind of started out dabbling in fanfic. You wrote your your novels and things. Um, and then what was your first, you know, like like serious work that you were like, okay, I this is more than a hobby. This is something I want to put out there professionally and have published. Um, was that your August Prather book, or did you have some some other attempts with uh, other books, or where, um, you know, what was that turning point for you? That was August Prather, actually. Yeah, I was like, this is the one that I'm going to put out there. Um, this one seems like the most legit and the least um, just sort of written to entertain myself and to sort of exercise my demons and stuff. But uh, it definitely felt like it could be relatable and interesting to other people. So I put it out there. And how long did it take you to, to write that? Um, I wrote it during uh, undergrad and college, uh, undergrad and grad school. So I wrote it, I think it took me four years, but that was because I was also writing a lot of term papers and Sure, you were a full-time things. student. <laughs> yeah, it had to share the, uh, the limelight there with, with, your, with your college. Um, so over the course of four years, you write this. And then what was your submission process like? Did you try to get an agent? Um, were you submitting to lots of places? You know, How did you find your publisher? Walk us through that journey. So it's 
funny story. I sat on the book for a long time. Like, I, I was like, well, you know what? That was fun. I, I don't know if I really want to do this. I was just too nervous about it, really. Um, I didn't know if I could handle, like, the rejection, you know, the infamous rejection. Um, or the of famous, course. I don't know. Uh, it's character <laughs> building, right? It's good for you. Um, and so then I, I guess a couple of years ago, so not that long from, not that long ago, I, I just thought, you know, I should just send some stuff out here. Um, I started reading a little bit more than I had been. Um, fiction. I've been reading a lot of nonfiction, architecture, and history. Um, and then I thought, oh, you know, there's a lot of indie publishing companies. There's a lot of opportunities uh, on the internet now that didn't exist. Um, yeah. So I should just put stuff out there. So I started sending it out. Um, I did a whole cleanse, like I, I stopped playing The Sims. <laughs> I started editing, Darn. Really rewriting and editing and making it nice and sharp again, and then I and then I sent it out. Um, I did not send it to agents. I sent it to some small presses, including Parliament, and um, they said they said yes. Um, yeah, so that was pretty cool. So, what year would this have been um, when you were like querying it out to these small presses? Two thousand and six. Yeah, so not that long ago. Wow. Okay. So, so give <laughs> or me sixteen. Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> one of those years, <laughs> they're kind of a blur. Not that long ago. Yeah. Once, once you're in your late twenties, it it's like a late. It's like just a blur. <laughs> the years start to blend together. True. Um, so, what? Um, well, first of all, give me what's just the general hook or gist. Uh, what's your elevator pitch for August Prather? Just so listeners kind of have a, a basis to go by as we as we continue to discuss the book. All right. So it's a road trip uh, and an epic quest. It's a story within a story. Um, lots of amazing, beautiful, weird kids, um, most of whom are queer, and um, a quest for... The elixir of life meets a a sort of modern day road trip across America. Uh, there's also ghost hunting. There's some folklore embedded in, and some real places that they visit. And uh, along the way, they meet a lot of interesting, strange people and have a good time and get to know each other better. <laughs> well, I can already think of like ten people off the top of my head that are already sold on. <laughs> On that concept, because that sounds, it sounds original and fun and amazing and quirky. Um, so would you say to people, like, if you're a fan of X book or X TV show or X movie, then you would be a fan of Danielle K. Rue's books. What what works would those be that you think that you would share a fan base? Um, Sense8, definitely. Um, the Netflix show Sense8 with... Uh just a huge cast of different characters all over the world, sort of the supernatural psychic kind of connection element, and then um, lots of uh, queer representation, lots of LGBTQ plus representation. Um, that show was really cool. It ended too soon, so sad. <laughs> um, yeah, and then just, I try to mix in a lot of different bits that I like from different genres, so it, it's definitely, it's got a little something for everybody, I feel like. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely some some more spooky, supernatural bits, but then it's also romantic, and um, it's kind of a road a road trip epic journey book, August Prather is. Um, and then my new series is a little bit more dystopian. Um, they're in a ruined city, and it's it's a lot more about their sort of understanding of their psychic powers and getting to uh, the bottom of the big, the big secrets that the city hides. So. Ooh, so it's like you have a little bit of that, is it sort of a little bit of that X-Men stuff where everybody's yes. got like their powers and then kind of X-Men meets the Hunger Games or something in yeah, terms of the dystopian. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Well, there you go. That's your, that's your uh, selling point <laughs> there. <laughs> that's your pitch there. <laughs> so, um, and I forgot to even I forgot to mention 
um, or I forgot to ask you, when you were conducting research for a publisher, was that, were you just Googling or was there like a resource that you wanted to shout out to or how did you conduct that research um, to find publishers? I was just Googling. Just <laughs> I ended up just sort of finding um, Parliament and I found a couple other little indie presses and I, I just sent letters. I, I, I was very particular about who I queried. I just was very much like, well, this is different and I love that it's different, um, but it's not everybody's sort of bread and butter. It can't go to like a regular old, you know, mm -hmm. contemporary romance novel type publishing place. So I was mm -hmm. like, hmm. Um, and then I found Parliament and it was like sci-fi, supernatural, um, fantasy, but different fantasy is kind of how they, they hooked me. And I was like, oh, I've got to send my stuff to them. They're perfect. <laughs> yes. And for anybody listening who is like Danielle that um, has a book where the protagonist or the main romance is, um, you know, lesbian, transgender, gay, queer, bi, um, there are some small presses out there that explicitly only take those kinds of romances. So there's more and more, you know, bit by bit representation um, coming out there. So you just got to know where to where to poke around for it. But I know Parliament House, um, you know, they do all of the above as well as the traditional stuff. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a great um, place to look into, especially if you've got kind of darker fantasy, urban fantasy, just something with a twist that's just different from the conventional. Um, but yeah, they're very, um, they're very open. Um, so I want to know, before we hit record, we, you had kind of mentioned to me, so the book came out in August and yes. you are, this is your, this is your first baby. So you are, um, working through this crazy jungle that is marketing. Yes. <laughs> and so, so tell us like, first of all, um, because I, I think that's the one thing that no author expects. We all think that really the battle is just finding a publisher and getting the book published. And, uh, once it's out there, okay, yeah, we'll post some stuff on social media or we'll send out a, a newsletter, you know, to friends and family. Um, and then maybe it'll kind of start to pick up on the charts and sell itself. And I mean, at least in my experience, not so. So what would you say to somebody um, who is maybe just starting out or their first book is about to be released? Uh, what are some things that definitely worked for you? Some pitfalls that definitely did not work for you? Uh, what are things that you wish you would have known coulda, shoulda, woulda, um, mistakes you would have avoided, or things that you're so happy that you did right and would gladly do again for your next release? Ooh, okay, so I definitely say get on, get on social media. Um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook have really great writing communities. Start tagging posts start making posts and, and it doesn't even have to be necessarily about the book. It can just be funny, funny quips or interesting photos that you've taken and just sort of start putting yourself out there and letting the world know that you're writing and that you're a writer and that you're part of this community. And then people actually are very, very supportive um, and end up uh, getting getting wind of you through the social media. Um, I had the mistake of like barely ever having a Facebook at all. My Facebook that I had from college was fake and had like 15 people knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I was not social media savvy at all. Um, I'm a really bad millennial, but um, so just knowing how to use the tools and manipulate them was, a, was an interesting discovery, but I feel like now I'm at a point where I'm like, oh, cool. So I feel like most people in the world would probably start off way better than I was. To do with <laughs> <laughs> Just because most people do post things online. Um, like, even my mother does. I don't know, like, what, yeah, yeah, what world I was living in, <laughs> where I thought, I can live without that. Um, but it's funny because a lot of my very close friends are, 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 are like that because of me, because of my, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm over this, I'm not doing this. And now they won't market my stuff for me. So I'm like, kind of, kind of bitch you. <laughs> um, so it is very helpful um, to be out there and to be posting all the things. 
Um, uh, I would definitely do, um, and reaching out to people. Like, I'm still kind of shy about it, but reaching out to bloggers and reaching out to, to, um, bookstagrammers and, and asking them like, Hey, um, I really like your content that you're posting. It seems like you would be interested in maybe reading my book. Um, could I send you an ARC or could I do this? That's something that I'm definitely going to do next time is be a little bit more forward and really plan to like market it ahead of time and during the release and really, really just try to keep contacting people and posting things and um, running um, things like release day parties on Facebook. Really, really helpful. Um, spreading the word. Yeah. So all of that stuff is, um, I was just barely able to do right before. <laughs> and, um, and then I also moved across the country. I was living in Baltimore and I, I Oh, represent. I grew up in Baltimore. Yeah. Oh, yay. Yeah. So I, I also at the same time decided my goals for, uh, my goals were to move to the Bay Area because I have some really close friends here. And uh, I just really like it. I've always visited and been like, this is the best place ever. So uh, I wanted to move here. So I have to get a new job here, day job. Um, and then, yeah, to publish a book. So it was like, why did I do that at the same time? <laughs> know. You know, the um, the day that my first book was published with my publisher, 4814, it was October 3rd, 2014. And I literally, like the day before moved out of state like my husband got a new job from Pennsylvania to Michigan and we were like the day my book came out we didn't even have wi-fi we had just gotten to the house like the night before it was empty the moving vans had not arrived we had no furniture we were sleeping on an air mattress and I had to take my laptop to Panera where they had Wi-Fi so that I could go get on Facebook and and you know post about my book being released. I don't know why I couldn't have just told the publisher to like hold off a week like at least till I had like furniture and Wi-Fi. <laughs> so I feel you on that. Sometimes the uh sometimes the publishing gods have other plans for us then. Um, I wanted to ask about social media because that is interesting to me that you have, um, you seem to be a big advocate of that um, for spreading the word. Have you found that social media is great for uh, for just that, for spreading the word, for spreading awareness, or is it actually selling you books? Because that seems to be um, a, a topic of debate, you know, that I've heard recently. Yeah, I don't know. So again, since I'm so new, it's, it is kind of something that I think about. I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm getting the word out. More people are, you know, liking my posts. Does that mean I'm going to sell more books? Right. Do the likes and shares translate into sales? It's too early to tell. I mean, I definitely have I have become aware of books that I wasn't aware of and uh, and purchased them because of social media <laughs> just to be nice and support and also things I hear of things that I'm like oh that's really interesting. Huh, so if I'll you are if your <laughs> if your patterns or your habits are any indication or like a microcosm of you know the way that the rest of the market behaves then that would be a good sign. I I've done the same. I can't say in particular. I can't recall if I've bought a book um, because I saw it on Facebook or I saw the author talking about it on Facebook, although I know I have bought books um, that were published by the same publishing companies as me, just because, I, and not only just to be supportive, but because I find I'm genuinely interested in the books that my publishers publish, I think, because we all kind of have the same taste and the same style. That's why we write what we write, and we happen to read the same type of stuff we write. So there's other authors, you know, putting forth similar content. Um, so I have found myself doing that, um, buying stuff based off of, you know, who the publisher is, or um, if I've been a fan of, of the author personally on social media, um, then if I see on Amazon they have a new book or I, you know, get their newsletter or something that they have a new book, um, then I buy it and read it and have fun with it. Um, 
But no, that's really interesting. So yeah, just um, at, at any rate, just being present, you know, having having a presence on social media, just to reach out to reviewers and spread awareness. And I tell new authors all the time, um, because a lot of them are like, oh, well, my book isn't out yet. And I don't even have the cover art. So um, I'm not going to start my website yet. I'm not going to start my newsletter yet. No, no, no. You start <laughs> as soon as you start freaking writing that book, and you've decided you're going to put like, you get your website you start collecting those email addresses you set up your social accounts it doesn't matter if you don't I mean there are so many people out there who already have all their stuff set up and lined up because you want to start collecting those people and building that following so that you have someone to announce it to when you have a cover reveal and you have someone to you know to sell to when you have a book for sale um so I I was similar to you. I avoided social media like the plague. I refused <laughs> to participate. I would not, the only thing that convinced me, I had friends and family up the wazoo begging me for years to have a Facebook account. I refused. And um, I only started a Twitter account because I was participating in PitMad way back in 2013 and 2014. Um, and then my publisher told me, you know, you need to set up a Facebook account and they they were the only people I would listen to. So <laughs> and then even then I back then you could have um a business page and not have to have a personal account. It was like a choice. Now they make you have a personal account if you want to have a business page. But back then um I only would do the business page and I still wouldn't deal with a personal account <laughs> cuz I just didn't I just didn't want the noise, you know. Uh, <laughs> But I have found it's been a social media has been such a blessing and a curse because like on on the one hand, you know, Facebook has enabled me. I mean, that's how that's how you and I connected. That's how I found out about um, Chantal Godori, who introduced me to Shane, who introduced me to the Parliament House, who, you know, I edited a couple of books for. So they added me to the authors group on Facebook. And then that's how I was able to connect with all of you authors and do these interviews with you. And so like, that's a great thing. Um, as well as I've also found many local events through this. I, you know, I'm I strongly recommend as well find a Facebook group that's in the area that you're in. So like for you, Danielle, you know, if, if you're not already become a member of like a Bay City area, you know, San Francisco authors, San Francisco authors events group and then any like bookshop or any indie author festival or, or street fair or just any possible event library sale or whatever um, they somebody posts about and that's how I find out about all the the personal and public events you know and, and appearances that I do um, so I found when I fast from social media because sometimes I, I just need a break um, then I kind of I do miss out on um, it's like, oh, you would have known about it if you would have been on Facebook. It's not like there's a newsletter coming to my email or, you know, text messages about this stuff. You just have to be on Facebook. Um, so that's, that's where it's kind of vital. Um, but then also I think it's a, it's a big distractor for us from writing. Um, <laughs> so we just... You just start scrolling through comparing yourself to like all the other people and like the feeling like I should just quit <laughs> and then your work in progress is just lingering there. Um, so your your current, your, your next release, This Will Kill That, um, did you say it was a series, part of a series? Yes. So This Will Kill That is the first book. The series is also This Will Kill That and... It is going to be four books. Book two doesn't have a title yet, and I'm almost done with it, but it doesn't have a title yet. I, it takes me a while to come up with them. But your titles um, are so awesome, so I know <laughs> it'll be good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, book three has a title. It's going to be A King and a Monster, so that's a cool title. Love it. Uh, book two has no title. Uh, book twos are hard. Uh, it's the first series I've written, so it'll be interesting. I'm trying to pace it correctly so that not too much happens, but enough happens that each book is interesting. Um, so that's been kind of a fun project for me. That's so exciting. So when is this Will Kill That scheduled to come out again? December. We don't have an exact release date yet, but a Tuesday in December. Oh, fantastic. So so <laughs> later, <laughs> later this year. And so where can... Um, 
do you have a newsletter or like what are your social media handles, your website? Where can people go to follow you or subscribe and find out, you know, when you've got a cover for your book, when you've got a release date, when it comes out? Um, so I'm on Goodreads, Danielle Rue. Um, I'm on Instagram, Danielle K. Rue, R-O-U-X. And I'm on Twitter at DK Rue. I have a website. Did I say my website already? I don't <laughs> think w- so. Give it to us w- again w- anyway. www.dkru.com. <laughs> uh, so it's an easy one. And uh, I post a lot on, on Twitter and Instagram. Not as much so on my website, but I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to post more stuff this week. Is your Instagram like a bookstagram, or do you just post like personal pics or... What's your I angle do a lot there? of bookstagram. I do some personal pics. I, I have cats, so I post pictures of my Ooh, cats. cat pictures. <laughs> Nobody doesn't like cat pictures. <laughs> um, usually not selfies because I, I am very self-conscious. <laughs> and also very cozy all the time. So. We so. writers tend to be. That's a, that's a common theme among us. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I'm going. Beautiful. Well, Danielle, was there anything else that you would like to add before we close up? I don't think so. I think that's it. Hopefully I won't regret that later. But yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a fantastic time speaking to you and I can't believe 36 minutes have gone by already because I feel like I just hit call. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time here with me this morning. Um, I'd like to ask anybody listening that if they enjoyed this interview to like the video, to maybe subscribe to my YouTube channel here so that you can be notified when I have new author interviews, more are coming. And you can check me out and get a hold of me quite easily at ckbrook.com. Danielle, uh, thank you so much once again for your time and for sharing about your books. And I wish you the best of luck with uh, with all of your writing and, and all of your publications. And once again, folks, if you want to visit her, she is at dkru.com. Did I get that right? Yes, that's correct. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. This was awesome. <laughs> I agree. You are awesome. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.